But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make for peace. God in heaven, we so desire that harvest of righteousness and peace. Help us to be those who are devoted to the wisdom that is from above, to be those who with unfolded heart are genuine and sincere, Father, without partiality, without duality, without a hypocrisy, Father. We exist for you and for your glory, and we ask you to lead us, Father, in ways of daily repentance to be in all ways holy and set apart for you so that our love will be real and genuine, that our lives will show out the light of the truth that's in Jesus. Father, help us to be those without controversy, without disputing, those who rest on the wisdom that is from above, God, wisdom that is above wisdom. We ask this, God, not for ourselves, but for your son's sake and for your glory. Help us to assemble this morning in this place with hearts full of worship, with eyes that are ready to be enlightened, with hearts that are good ground, ready for your word to be sown and planted inward. We ask by your grace to lead us by your spirit to give us understanding of your truth, that we can understand Romans rightly, Father, and so that we can live it for your glory. To announce right now, Anna Sanchez is going to come up, and she's going to read us our text from Romans 5. Let's listen. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commands his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Amen. Man, great text for us this morning to be in together. Before we continue our walk on our Roman road together, Romans 5 this morning. Would you all be so kind one more time to stand and receive our teacher, our beloved brother, Sam Pittenger. Thank you. You can be seated. Thanks. You can open to Romans chapter 5. We're going to do the first 11 verses this morning. I've titled this, The Love of God Poured Out. Uh, the middle portions of Romans, chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, are inspiring and really profound to our newly warmed hearts. They show the unquenchable love of the Father and his relentless righteousness. They show his incredible grace to us through Jesus, and they are to compel us to live unto righteousness, to no longer count ourselves as those under the power of sin, 
but in the glorious liberty of the children of God. And I think these middle chapters, starting with chapter 5, begin to touch the heart of the gospel. The affections of it, as it were. Because in these chapters, the love of God is shown as poured out. And in two particular ways. By the Holy Spirit, which animates us and makes us to know and love our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the historical evidence and demonstration of the cross, the banner of the love of God. This is love. Christ Jesus gave himself for us. And if these chapters touch our hearts and then rule our thinking, our lives see transformation. Our lives are useful to the glory of God, even as we face this world, which is hostile and in serious trouble. I've, I've taught probably thousand-something teachings, which is a joy. And every so often, God gives me a particular burden for a particular text or topic. And I feel that kind of burden for this kind of text. As we go through chapters 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, if we allow this to be the truth to us, about us, and for us, we will see the blessedness of Christ's completed work in our lives. So we're going to open, actually, in chapter 4, in verse 23. A running start from Father Abraham, who had righteousness credited or imputed to his account because he believed. But it wasn't written for his sake alone. It was written for ours. Verse 23, it says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that righteousness was imputed to him, but for ours also, to whom it shall be imputed or credited if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered over for our offenses and who was raised again for our justification. Remember, how does God justify the ungodly? Well, he credits the righteousness of Jesus Christ to their account through faith. So it was with Abraham, so it is with all who believe. We exchange our sin and guilt for the sinless righteousness of the perfect Son of God. Because he was delivered over for our offenses and he was raised again for our justification. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, being justified, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this whole chapter of chapter 5 is based on being justified. Those first words, therefore, being justified, we. This chapter will show the blessedness of righteousness, the blessedness of being accepted with a new right status before God. Welcome into his forever fellowship through the sinless perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So being justified, we also have peace. Being justified, we also have grace. Being justified, we also can rejoice in the glory of God. Being justified, we can rejoice in tribulations. Being justified, we will be saved from the wrath to come. Being justified, we exult, we joy in God to whom we've been reconciled. And if you'll notice in verse 1, the language changed to we. We have peace. And this is pretty profound. Romans started with I. I'm an apostle. I'm not ashamed to preach the gospel. Then it talked about them, those ungodly, unrighteous, worldly ones. Then it talked about you, whoever thought they weren't included in that first part. You self-righteous, critical, moralizing person. Then it talked about them again. So you and them and they and everybody actually all are under sin. Then it changed and it started saying, all who believe, there is a kind, there is a type, a new kind of humanity who believes. But now in Romans 5, it's we. Now in Romans 5, it's profoundly personal, but it's also profoundly collective. So Romans is making a new kind of humanity. Romans is showing the new creation that God is doing. It's not just me. It's not just you. It's we all together because of the allness 
of Christ's work. We'll read through this a little bit, and then we'll go back. In verse 2, it says, By whom? By Jesus. Also, we have access by faith into grace, wherein we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, this isn't the only thing. We also are rejoicing in something else. Tribulations also. Knowing this, that tribulation works or produces patience. And patience produces experience, like a proven character. And a proven character experiences or produces hope. Now, why does it talk about tribulations after all these pleasant things, like glory and justification and peace? And we'll see it's because in these sorts of things, the blessedness of Christ's work is fully seen. The love of God is shown actually through the hardship. And this hope, verse 5, makes us not ashamed, not disappointed, because the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. There's this perfect expression of God's love in twofold way, through the Holy Spirit that is given to us and by the demonstration of the sacrifice of Christ in a word, the cross. Look at verses six through eight. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for, on behalf of the ungodly, Scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commends or he demonstrates his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. If God could do the harder thing of bringing dead and in sin into life and righteousness by the death of his sinless son, he'll do the comparatively easier thing of saving us from his future wrath against ungodliness than unrighteousness. Justified by his blood, we're saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Because we're justified, we shall be saved. Isn't that awesome? You are saved, but you shall be saved. A lot of the kingdom of God is like that. It is yes, but not yet. Already seen, but not fully seen. But all of this is because you have been justified. All of it is because of the sinless one who leads us into the presence of God as accepted. So not only is this so in verse 11, there's actually something even greater. Not only so, but we also joy, exult, rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We've been reconciled. All of this is to bring us to a singular point, to joy in God. We have been reconciled, brought into relationship with him, that we might joy in him. And the chief end of man is to know God and to enjoy him forever. So this chapter sets forth these affirmations. We've been justified, so we have peace. We've been justified, so we stand in grace. We've been justified, so we rejoice actively in God's glory. We've been justified, so we can rejoice while facing tribulations. We've been justified, so we're assured that we shall be saved. And we've been justified, so we boast in God. Back to verse 1. So you'll see that this has touched us, we, in a profound, powerful way. Verse 1 again, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, righteousness and justification are essentially the same thing. And to be justified means we have a new right status with God as forgiven and as accepted into his loving presence and fellowship forever. As we've been saying, this righteousness is from God for us through a sinless Savior. So it's not my righteousness, but his, which he has credited to me. And because we're justified, here is one blessed thought. We have peace with God. You were justified, and when you're justified, you're forgiven. 
And because you're forgiven, there's peace. Peace means the end of hostility. So the strife that existed between us and God has ended. The hostility is gone. But even more so, all is well. The striving has ceased, but all is well. Previously, in chapter 3, we were still enemies of God, deserving of his just wrath against unrighteousness and ungodliness. But by chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with this holy and righteous God. We've been reconciled together in relationship so that he is for us and he is with us. There's a peaceful, harmonious relationship. If you think about your life and everything's going well in it, maybe you're killing it at work. You know, every, every, you hit every green light, you know. It never rains. But there's that one really, really important person in your life. For me, it's my wife. And there's strife there. I'm actually truly weak in that case. I might seem strong outside, but if that core relationship has separation, everything else is in weakness. And so it is for human beings. All can be well on the outside in the world. You can get every green light that never rains and crush it at work. But if it's not right and peaceful with the Father, you're in a place of weakness and helplessness. So we've been called into harmonious relationship with God as our Father. Isn't that beautiful? It says through the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians tells us that he made peace through the blood of his cross. He bought and purchased peace. He took the hostility of sin upon himself so that we could be at peace. On the cross, Jesus is the mediator between God, God and man. He is the peacemaker of the kingdom of God. So I cannot undo the peace that God has given me through Christ. If we've ever felt separated from the Father in any sort of way, it's not on his end, it's on ours. The peace has been made and we've been brought close in harmony. What's really beautiful, it's the peace of Christ that was given to us. So in some measure, we have a taste of what the Father has with his only Son, his only sinless Son. And we have it because of his death and resurrection. Jesus talks about this right before he goes to the cross. He says in chapter 14 of John, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In John 16, verse 31, right before the famous prayer of chapter 17, he says, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So in some measure, we've received that peace of Christ, and we get to experience it. So what a, what a joyous thought. Everything around me can be turmoil. Everything around me can be upheaval and unrighteousness and darkness. And yet, I have peace with my Father through my Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. By whom, that's by Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God. By him, by Christ, we have access. So it gives us this picture. He is ascended up into the heavens, and he appears in the presence of God for us, seated at the right hand of the Father. And we follow behind him in a blaze of glory into God's presence. We have access. We've been led into the presence of God with an open approach before him. We are accessing God's presence with 
acceptance, with justification. If you think about this, God, it says in Timothy, dwells in unapproachable light. He is the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And we're waltzing right in through Christ Jesus. And we're coming into his presence with acceptance. And it says that we stand in grace. I kind of think of this as like a sea of grace. You're in it and engulfed by it, and all around you is grace in the presence of God. We've been introduced, led, access to God's presence by grace, and we stand continually, not by our merit, but by his grace. So this isn't a fleeting entrance into the presence and fellowship of our Father. Instead, we have access. We're standing. We're not falling in and out of favor with God. We're held together by his grace. You know, this is like a whole new way to be a human being. Maybe we've gotten a little too used to it. But face God face to face like everyone will one day. And his throne is so brilliant that all of heaven and earth fled away. And know that you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, standing in grace before God rejoicing in his glory. That's freedom. That's fellowship. That's openness. And that doesn't quite sound like chapters 1, 2, and 3. Because we're justified, it also tells us we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Justification leads to peace, grace with God, and it makes it so that we can rejoice in God's glory. Without justification, without peace with God, a future where God is glorified would be terrifying. Why? Because God is coming to judge the world in righteousness. And so he's against ungodliness, he's against evil, he's against darkness, he's against sin. And so, that would be a fearful thing. But instead, because we're justified, because God accepts us as his beloved child in his presence, through Jesus Christ, making peace with us, bathing us, and letting us stand in grace, we rejoice in his glory. And we have hope in his glory. Our hope is certain. Our expectation of the future is sure. That it will be, as God has said, that he will make everything new and everything right. And God will be all in all. And what's so beautiful, our hope is not in an idea, but in God himself. In his name being shown as excellent. In him being exalted above all forever, we're placing our hope in the living God. You know, God's glory is already being revealed in heaven and earth, Romans chapter 1, in the person and the work of his son, Jesus Christ, and in his new creation in the church. His glory is already being revealed, but we're rejoicing in a hope of glory where God is fully exalted and recognized by heaven, earth, and all things as holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, from whom all things have come. They exist by his will for his glory. And that final day, when that will be recognized, by everyone for forever, and it will be an eternal song of praise to the glories of God. That is our hope. That is what gives us joy now. That is what gives us joy now. When we think about eternity, I know I can do this. We can be rather small-minded about it. We can think, well, thank God I get to live forever. I can't wait till Jesus comes back because then all my problems will go away. And we can turn the 
eternal days into something uh, much smaller and self-focused than they are. The object of eternity is not merely to have forever life. That is part of it. The object of eternity is, as our Lord Jesus Christ said, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So the point of being a human right now, you exist for the glory of God, to know him and enjoy him forever. In Romans 1, what did it say? When they knew him as God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful. So when it comes to heaven, earth, humanity, history, and eternity, I think that covers everything that we know about. The whole point of the entire thing is so that God would be glorified as the only true God who is to rule over all and to be all in all. So at the end of the age, everything in creation is about the creator. It all exists for him. It all exists by him. It's all for his glory. So we get to be a part of that awesome glory story. It's not actually about us. It's about the glory of God and what he has done through the lamb, Jesus Christ. And in this, we rejoice. So if this scripture is true, this is supposed to give me a joy today, an unshakable hope today, despite that I live in a world that is in serious trouble. Despite that I live in a world that is hostile to godliness, despite that I live in a world with deceptions of sin, Satan, and self. There's joy in the glory of God. We do well to get caught up just thinking about how glorious God is. We do well to kind of forget what time it was and exalt over God in our thoughts and in our prayers and in our talk together uh, to remind ourselves of the glory of God. When we read about Abraham, it said, but giving glory to God, he was made strong in his faith. As he gave God glory and exalted and joyed in him, it increased his faith. So this hope of the glory of God is supposed to lift our hearts out of the muck of temporal things. Stop being so caught up in the culture, in work, in responsibilities, or as Jesus puts them, the cares and pleasures of this life. Start being caught up in the glorious things of God, and that lifts our hearts to the heavenly. These two verses, we're only two verses in, show us the blessedness of justification in the past, present, and the future. In the past, we were forgiven, so we have peace. It's done. We have peace. Can't lose it. In the present, we're in grace. So no matter what we do that isn't peaceful with God, still we're in grace, standing in access before him. And in the future, we have a glorious inheritance with God and with the Lamb, the glory of God. Verse 3. And not only so, but we also glory or we rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, or that is, tribulation produces patient endurance. And patient endurance produces experience. You've got some character, some godliness. And experience produces hope, and hope makes us not disappointed because the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. Uh, we, we boast, we rejoice on account of tribulations. And, and yeah, you're supposed to kind of look at that sideways. What are you talking about? Tribulations are pressures. And the pressures of Romans are the hostile nature of the world. Uh, the course of this world, which is run by Satan, which is filled with sin, which is self-serving. These put pressure, suppressing the truth of God. And they give place to exchange truth for a lie. 
These pressures are seen and they're experienced in various ways, whether it's deceitfulness of sin in our own lives, the attempts of Satan to destroy, or the basic course of the world. But what it's telling us is we rejoice in these pressures because we can have a confident hope and we can face these pressures with joy and confidence in our God. So it tells us we rejoice in tribulations knowing this. So next time you face that hard thing, which is probably right now, know this. It will produce something better in you. It will produce endurance. It will produce character. And it will produce hope. A trusting expectation in God's glory. It is necessary that we face tribulations in this world because it is hostile. Paul tells the Thessalonians that through many sufferings, you will enter the kingdom of God. Until God makes everything new and everything righteous, there will be evil. Sufferings are the only path to glory. This was true for Jesus. What did he say? The Son of Man must suffer all things and then enter into his glory. So it's true for the Christian, which Romans 8 will tell us more about, but I'll give you a sneak peek. It says in Romans 8, 17, if children then were heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We're going to go through them. We have to. We live in a world in serious trouble. So sufferings lead to glory, an uncomparable glory. But in the meantime, Romans is telling us they will also lead to our maturity. Rejoicing in tribulations, knowing this, that it builds your godly character and it builds your true trust in the glory of God. So it's a difficult thought that hard things are good for your faith. But they are. Without them, we would never really have to prove out the faith in Christ that we have. You know, you never have to make your own clear statement of faith if you were never faced with sin or unrighteousness or evil. You know, you never have to make that clear distinction between the will of God and the ways of the world or that clear choice between righteousness and unrighteousness. And without these pressures, we literally would never learn to endure. We'd be very soft. We'd never learn to endure because without the pressures, there would be nothing to endure. Even Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. It is in his sufferings that his obedience was made perfect and most fully expressed. And we'll find that too. It's easy to put our trust in God in a vacuum of everything's well. But when everything is not well around you, to put your confident hope and joy in the glory of God and the peace of God, that is approving of our faith. I think about it in a really simple way. Say you have one of those days where everything's upside down. And then you get home and this, everything makes you irritable. Maybe you're hungry, that's for me. But there are those times where it's like, it doesn't even take much. Get a flat tire, somebody says something to you sideways. We're not even talking Gethsemane. And then see how much peace with God means to you then. When somebody reminds you of a simple truth, like, hey, well, isn't God still good? It's like, I know, I don't want to hear that right now. We do this. But the scripture is really clear that this life is not about avoiding troubles. It's about facing troubles with hope in God. 
It's about running the race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and was set down at the right hand of God. And as we run the race with patience, it produces a godly character, which increases our trusting hope in God himself and his glory through his son, Jesus Christ, so that we are not ashamed. Verse 5, we're not ashamed by this hope. So think about it this way, if you'll allow me one more moment in verse 4. The next time it gets difficult to be Christian in our culture, in this evil world, the Bible and God are telling you, rejoice. Don't back out. Don't blend in. Don't become camouflage. Rejoice. The next time you have a hard thing with a relationship, the next time you have a challenge person to person, rejoice. This is an opportunity to be stretched in Christ-like love, to grow in the faith. The next time Satan attacks with temptations of pressures or pleasures, The scripture is telling us, rejoice. This is your opportunity to prove your love for the Father through simple faithfulness. The next time somebody makes fun of you, mocks you, pressures you, slanders you for the name of Christ, and somewhat, sometimes, that's in the church. Rejoice. Jesus says, great is your reward in heaven. They also did it to the prophets. So this increases us in the hope of God's glory, which will not disappoint us. Look at verse 5 again. This hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which he gave to us. What is really the ground of our hope? This is so beautiful. The steadfast love of God. How can you be so sure about the future? How can you be so sure that you'll escape the one thing nobody can escape, the grave? How can you be so sure that you're not going to be in nothingness forever? The steadfast love of God. We can be sure of this even in sufferings and pressures, like you talked about in verses 3 and 4, right? Did you know, actually, in sufferings and pressures, when you feel most tempted to think God is not with me, is the perfect time to know that you can never be separated from the love of God. I think you know that section in Romans 8. That's one of the ones we don't skip by. We're like, I like this, the more than conqueror part. But in all those famine, nakedness, peril, sword, we cannot be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. So these sufferings and these pressures and the uncertainty of this time is the perfect time to experience the love of God. Not when everything is well or everything is okay, but when everything is broken, like in this world. It's the perfect time to experience God's love. How did God prove this to us? How can I say that? Because he's shown it in two particularly spectacular ways. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And then in verses 6 through 8, through the cross. We have the active work of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which has poured out God's love in our cold-hearted, stony, hard-hearted hearts. And given us a surety that God really does love us. This is something we experience by the active work of the Holy Spirit, that God really has loved us. And this Holy Spirit animates us to the love of God. It illuminates us to the love of God. It shows us the love of God. It works it in our hearts that we can't like get away from this idea that God has his loving hand upon us. We can know We can experience the love of God in our hearts because God himself is working it in us. This is active. But there's also an immovable historical display 
of the love of God. And this is what it is. It's the cross of Christ, verse 6. For when you were out yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for an upright man would one die. Perhaps for a good man some would dare to die. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Again, this is how we know the love of God. It's through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross in sacrifice for us. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Why is that the demonstration of God's love? Well, the essence of love is sacrifice. The essence of love is giving. God gave all. All that he had, his only begotten, his sinless son for people who did not love him. For people who didn't deserve it. And so the cross, Christ's sacrifice, is the place where God's justice and love meet in the most holy way. Remember, he is just, and if he wasn't just, he wouldn't be loving. And so he's just, so he punished sin in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Sin must be reckoned when sin must be paid for, so Christ paid the penalty in his death. And God's justice against sin was satisfied. And the love of God is shown because this cross of Christ is the gift of God to the world, which Corinthians calls his unspeakable gift. That he gave everything he had to redeem those who had nothing. And his holiness is shown in this because God doesn't excuse sin. He is holy, holy, holy. He simultaneously judges sin and in his unique and only love gives like no other. So when you look at the cross of Christ, when you look at the sacrifice of Jesus as the Lamb of God, this shows us who God is. His character, his attributes. God is holy. God is just. God is love. And the cross displays that. But the cross also shows us who we were. Don't forget those verses in 6 through 8. Paul's not letting us get away from that. Verse 6, it describes us. We were without strength, which means you're weak. Generally proud people don't like to be told they're little weaklings. But we were without strength. We were ungodly, it says. Again, that's against God. We were against. We were not righteous and not good. We've discovered all this in Romans. Which means we haven't shown ourselves worthy of anything. Perhaps if you were a good man. Someone might even think about dying for you. But what about a sinner? While we were yet sinners... While we were still under sin's power, helpless and hopeless, Christ died for us. This is the emblem of God's love. You know, when he died, the people around him were sinning against him, and yet he was dying for them. Humanity at its worst in the crucifixion of the sinless Son of God, and yet he is dying for them. Before we even knew that we needed a Savior, he was saving. And again, salvation is important is impactful to our hearts when we realize that we have a salvation from sin, which we desperately needed. So this costly and precious gift of love in Christ Jesus was not something we could earn, something God alone gives. And so Christ died, it says, for the ungodly and for us. He gave himself on our behalf. He was our substitute. The death that I owed, he paid himself. The sin that I carried, he carried himself. And because of this, we have been welcomed into the presence of God as he is. Clothed with Christ's righteousness, sinlessness, and sonship. It's the greatest exchange that has ever taken place. The just for the unjust. This is the love of God. John, the apostle, puts it this way. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 
He puts it this way. In this was demonstrated the love of God to us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. We were dead. Now we have life. And he says this. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment for our sins. So when Jesus was dying on the cross, he was the peacemaker of the kingdom of God. He's the emblem of the love of the Father. And he is drawing all people to God in reconciliation and God's justice, love, and holiness, even us. And on our behalf. So be assured in those difficulties and troubles. In the pressures of this life, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And we're sure of it because of the love of God, which God shows by the Holy Spirit working in our hearts to know God. And which he's shown historically in the unshakable banner of love of the cross of Christ. So it's compelling that God has justified us. We have peace. We stand in grace. We rejoice in his glory. We rejoice in tribulations. And we know the love of God. We experience it. And we've seen the unmistakable sign of the Christ who gave himself for us. As if it couldn't get better, it says in verse 9, much more than... Much more then, there's still much more to come. There's that glory thing. There's that eternal thing. Much more being now justified. Again, this is a result of justification. Through his blood, the sinless blood, we shall be in the future saved from wrath through him. We'll be saved from wrath through Jesus Christ. In verse 10, it tells us why. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you know why you'll be saved from the wrath of God against ungodliness and sin? Because Jesus lives. And he's going to come and gather his people to himself so that they're not on the justice end of the wrath of God. Experiencing what sin and evil have coming to them. And Satan. So now that we've been justified, and now that we've been reconciled, which is like we're ushered into a restored relationship, we shall be saved. We shall be saved. And we'll be saved because Christ ever lives. You know, it's so beautiful. It speaks of this reconciliation to God, that we've been returned to him. We're his redeemed family. We're brought back to his loving presence with right status. We and God and the Lamb are at one. As Jesus is going to the cross, to his sufferings, he prays in John 17, this very thing, that they, those who believe, may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one, in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Again, it's so much bigger than us, but God is so good to our little lives. At one, fellowship with the Father and the Son and the entire redeemed family of God. Being justified, we have peace. We rejoice. We shall be saved. And not only so, we do one more thing in verse 11 to close. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement that at one meant, the reconciliation. All of this, the purpose of everything we're reading, brings us to this singular point, to joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, not ourselves. Romans earlier talks about where is a law of boasting? Who can stand before God and say, I have done something? Where we join God, not through ourselves, but through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. He rules our lives. And we are riding his spiritual coattails into eternity. 
And now, right now, we've been brought to joy in God, where we're reveling over him. We're exulting over him. We're rejoicing in him that he is ours and we are his forever. Again, the point of being a human is to know God, the only true God, and to enjoy him forever. And through Jesus Christ, and only because of Jesus Christ, we do and we can. So our lives go from boasting in ourselves and in all the broken cisterns of this world to boasting in God himself. That is a redemption through justification by faith in Jesus Christ that should get us out of the bed tomorrow and give us a reason to be living. When you look at the Apostle Paul, and this is why in closing I have a burden for these chapters. When you look at the Apostle Paul, when you look at the Apostle Peter, when you look at Stephen, who gave his life for this cause, when you look at James, who was beheaded for this, when you look at the brothers and sisters around you or that you've known and that you admire in the faith, what is it that compels them? What is it that gives them a purpose in life, a clarity about truth, and a will to live for God's glory? What is it? It's this. It's this. Paul puts it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. And the Holy Spirit helper illuminates this to our hearts that we rejoice that we exalt, that we revel in knowing God and enjoying him forever as his redeemed family. So let this get you out of the bed tomorrow morning. Let this give you one more day to love him and serve him because there is a day that is coming. We will be saved when Jesus appears. But until that time, we are rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Sure love you all. Anything to do before we close? Okay, well, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your glorious thoughts toward us. Help us to see your glory and the magnificence of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to love one another as a reflection of your love toward us. and Help us to cling to your truth in the midst of a world that's in serious trouble. But we thank you for this good news and your message of Romans help our hearts to love you and to serve you with our eyes wide open to the truth that you've given us in your word. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.